Hello and welcome to Nine Inch Charge, a Warhammer Age of Sigma and Warhammer the Old World discussion channel. Today we are going to record the Old World episode four and we're going to be looking at Wood Elves in the Old World. My personal favourite army of all of the armies in the Old World and it is my absolute great pleasure to be joined by Luke of Cinderfall Gaming. Welcome. Hey, nice to have me here. Um, nice to be here as well, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much, Luke. I, Luke, I think of all the people that I know, you are the person who I would say equally, and if not, maybe even a little bit, maybe you love the Wood Elves a little bit even more than I do. Um, yeah, no, Wood Elves have been a big love of mine in fantasy for many a year. I finally just painted up an army of them after I don't know how many years, um, but yeah. Um, why don't you just talk to us a little bit about your history collecting Wood Elves and I guess specifically the reason why you love them so much and want to see them return in this new game all right so i guess to start with like what else is to start with like how i got into warhammer in general so like probably many people my age i got into warhammer via um getting a box of hero quest with my cousins and i went straight for that elf um that was my first sort of love into like elves and all that sort of stuff and around the time I got that. We soon found a games workshop store. That was at one of my local, like, um, just big shopping malls. And I went and grabbed some Wood Elf Dryads, the old terrible, terrible Dryad models. <laughs> um, uh, the it's old metal ones. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember them. Um, and so I picked them up. I. Also picked up a box of Lord of the Ring elves, which were wood elves as well, because at the time Lord of the Rings was in the cinemas. A couple of years later, when I was in high school, um, 2006 rolled on, and all of a sudden wood elves got the amazing 2006 release, um, the big revamp line, and it was glorious. I remember just going hard in on them, getting like all my birthday, all my Christmas presents is what I was spending <laughs> all my, my hard earned cash as a, um, a teen working at my um, local KFC, spending all that money I earned there <laughs> to get more and more what else, $18 a week for a unit of um, three pack of eternal guard um, or some way watches. Man, that um, release was really spectacular. I can remember. I think that was really a step forward in terms of model production. And there's a lot of models that came out then that like still stand up really strong to this day. Like, I know we've got Plastic Eternal Guard now, but like that blister pack that you're talking about of those, those mm -hmm. three, they were they were amazing. Yeah, it was the first time where we saw multiple different sculpts, so it wasn't the same generic pack of three. Um, mm. For those maybe not quite as old in the game as us, there used to be a time we used to go buy blister packs and used to be searching for like the alternate models. Um, yeah, like you could do it with like the Wood Elf Glade Lords was a great one. We'd have Glade Lords, but there were like eight different Glade Lord models. Um, and you know the spell singers, I remember like searching high and low for every to make sure I got all four of the um, spell singers that were released. Mm. I guess so. So what you're saying is kind of what drew you to them was the aesthetic and the fact that Lord of the Rings had been out like at that time. I think for me, I started collecting them. Um, a friend of mine had some and he didn't want them. And and as soon as he gave me them and I started painting them and looking at them, I just got I just got really hooked. And the aesthetic was was really great for me because um, growing up, I used to like watching like Robin Hood and things like that. And it kind of fit that kind of aesthetic. And I think also for me, the more I got involved in the lore, the more I really enjoyed them as well. And I really liked that they they were an aligned good army and they fought against chaos, but they weren't. They were a bit more three dimensional than that. Uh, you know, I started off with high elves and they you know, they do have their nuances and things and they are a bit too proud and too arrogant. But the Wood Elves are more nuanced and they are they will fight for good in the world, but they also are kind of only out for themselves and they have they're not afraid to be a bit sneaky and to do kind of they have hidden agendas and things that they do and you know they know things that are going on through the prophetesses and things, but they don't necessarily let on to other races and they'll let things play out a certain way um that favours them. And I've really enjoyed that. Yeah, I, I do enjoy like the self serving. It it's very reminiscent of that the Lord of the Rings style elves where they are sort of like their own sort of 
out for themselves. They're, they're just very focused on their own world rather than the actual whole world as a point. Mm. But um, I think, Luke, we could go on and on and on just talking about reasons why we love Waddells and reasons why we started collecting them and models in the range that we really liked. But today we obviously are here to talk about the new game that is going to come out, the old world. And we know from the Bretonian article roughly when the game is going to be set, which is in the 2200s of the Imperial calendar. So what I thought we would do is we just go through some points on the on the timeline and see what is happening for the Waddells around this time that the game will be set. Sounds like a good plan. Do you have all your books at hand? <laughs> I, I do. So I've got um, the current, uh, well, I say current, I mean, technically it's the current. It's the eighth edition of Waddell's book. Um, and then we've got the... Uh, the original and the O6. Oh, nice. So we are we are fully fully armed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Our quiver is fully stocked. Yeah. Uh, full of arcane bodkins. <laughs> okay, so the game is going to take place in what the Wood Elves will call the season of doom. Um, Luke, do you want to just touch on why they call it the season of doom? Yeah, so the season of doom is called it because originally at the start of it we have Naif the prophetess, um, who you can see is the lovely character on our original book cover. Um, she sort of has she's a wood elf series. She's like the highest series of all the wood elves. Ariel, the queen herself, goes to her for all the prophets, prophecy and stuff like that. Um, and she has this this hazy vision and dream of like the forest burning, chaos overflowing around the world, um, and just like fire and chaos everywhere. And she obviously warns Ariel of this, and this is why the world is called the season of doom because this impending doom that they've seen coming about. And um, how right she was, sadly. Yeah, well, this is the um, the time where it's just, yeah, everything's going to go to, yeah, not good. <laughs> um, but at least with this game coming back, we can kind of relive the glory years, I suppose, before the end times. Yeah, because yeah, the Wood Elves were really starting to be quite an expansive race in this point in time. Like, they were starting to, like, branch out. Uh, if you um, excuse the, <laughs> the awful pun. <laughs> um, and, like, start to spread their roots across the entirety of the old world and further as well um, to other places like even as far as Ulthwan and Nagroth. Um, yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. So before the, I guess before the season of Doom, there was no real formal relationship between the Wood Elves and the other Elven races. Um, but in the year... The Imperial Calendar between 2001 and 2051, Finnebar, who will, who would become the Phoenix King about 100 years after that, sailed to the Old World and you know made contact with the Empire, Bretonia, the Wood Elves, and even the Dwarves. He kind of went on like a diplomatic mission to kind of so the High Elves would start reaching out into the world again. Um, and as part of that, they you know they made contact with the Wood Elves, you know a race who they hadn't seen for. I, I don't know how long, really. Maybe well, they didn't even know they existed. Yeah. Um, um, and this is how Finnebar actually gets his name, the Seafarer, because he goes across the seas to make all these diplomatic relations as well. Um, on an aside. Yeah, and the Wood Elves at that point are asked if they will kind of come back into the fold and become part of the High Elves once more, um, and they uh, they decline. <laughs> yeah, and. There's an interesting twist here as well. The Wood Elves, at the same time, they have Finnebar and some stuff. They have some Dark Elves there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is, I think the Dark Elves want them to kind of join their quest against the High Elves, and the High Elves want them to join the quest against the Dark Elves, and they both kind of want to bring them into the fold. But I think neither of them really realise that at this point, the Wood Elves aren't some long lost stranded race that are waiting to come back they've actually kind of evolved and their culture and society has changed so much and they've become something brand new that they that they feel that they want to protect and they don't they're actually quite wary of outside influence however you know there are some things that happen that kind of point to us that they do Finnebar is, is fairly successful in his mission in that he does strengthen ties between the high elves and the wood elves 
Yeah, um, so it's really interesting this time because there's um, the point where like um, Finnebar obviously is like strengthening all those relationships and stuff, which is important because it this comes back to play a lot later down the line in the end times of like those relationships between them, um, but definitely the strengthening and like the beginning of like the Wood Elves and High Elves actually acknowledging each other's existence and knowing about each other's existence is massive. And it does come to play um, later on in something we'll talk about specifically. Um, so I guess why don't we jump forward to um, year 195 of the season of Doom, which is just about where this um, game is going to be set. So if you go back and watch the Bretonia video or you've read the articles, you'll know that um, Luan Orkslayer is king of Bretonia at this time, and he was famous for running his errantry wars against the Greenskins. Um, and what he did was essentially he just he fought a campaign to flush out the Greenskins and rid the land of Orcs and Goblins and then solidify, I guess, the human population as the dominant force in the, in the kingdom of Bretonia. But what that led to was, you know, Britonia is surrounded by mountains on one side, sea on the other, and Athalorin Forest to the, to the south. So there's not that many places that, that the Greenskins could flee, and an awful lot of them then just turned up on the doorstep of Athalorin and started invading the forest and chopping down trees and doing what they do best. Um, so that this season is all this is time and time time it's called dearth who's rage so the little bit of fluff that i've got for this is by the time of the year 195 the errantry wars in bretonia succeeded in driving the green skins from the heartlands into the wild corners of the kingdoms as it happened one such corner was athol Lorin, in and in the middle reaches of the forest found themselves inundated by a tide of green skins yeah um, so it doesn't really go well for the Wood Elves at this particular point in time, um, as this just these orcs like just push to try and hide wherever they can. And well, the orcs don't really understand exactly what Athalorin it is is in itself, um, and they just start hacking and burning and trying to effectively defend themselves from the Bretonians in the Errantry War. Um, and of course, when you start defiling Athalorin, this brings the forest spirits more than anyone into action. Yeah, and there's a really great part of the story where Durthu, obviously it's called Durthu's Rage, so Durthu wakes up and he is, you know, he's never been the calmest of forest spirits, shall we say. He's got a big angry face and a big angry sword and he starts cleaving through them and fighting through them and leading this army to fight back the uh, the Greenskins and the war boss who leads them, whose name escapes me, he ultimately slays him. He doesn't use his sword, he just stomps his massive great big foot on him and like pushes him into the ground and roots are like surrounding him and burying him and just crushes him um and that is dirty's rage so that's something that i'd really like to see come into play because now we kind of know that we've got the air that we'll see the errantry wars and we'll see the orcs and goblins and there is space for the wood elves to be fighting in that war yeah um and there's a lot of things sort of happening around the time as well obviously um the sort of timeline for this as well is slightly after um, uh, Cienthar has been destroyed. Um, one of the times anyway. Uh, Cienthar, Morga, the great changer, whatever you want to call him, uh, the mm. corrupted beastman dude. Um, the last time he was slain, like just before, is by Scarlock and, his, um, and the scouts. Yeah. And actually in... Um... 2231 so luon i think was crowned in 2201 so sort of 30 years after he was crowned and a little bit after the errantry wars have been fought um morga is born again into the world into the bretonian forest of arden yeah um and so this effectively leads to araloth getting charged with leading a force into there to sort of go and get him. Um, and Aralos a really interesting character, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about him later, but he's a really interesting character. And he sort of has this magical tree sap that gets gifted to him. Um, and effectively, things do not go well for the Wood Elves, but they do succeed. Yeah, so 
as you will be able to see on the on the map that we were given, there is a wood elf kind of emblem in the forest of Arden, which tells me that we we'll probably will see this played out in the game, as you know, at least in the lore. But I hopefully we'll see it in the game. We'll see beastmen because um, jumping forward to the latest Kislev, um article, uh, which we haven't covered yet, which we'll probably cover in episode five, um, there are little beastmen um, emblems in the in the in the great forests of of the empire. So that kind of suggests to me that we may well, way well we may well see, see this because we've got both emblems in different forests at the same time. So what kind of happens is Araloth decides that he's going to charge off and he's going to he's going to slay him. Um, he kind of takes the mantle upon himself to do that. And um, they go at it very directly and not in a very wood elfy kind of way where they just march their army up to the forest of Arden. I think they use some kind of magics to hide their army from the Bretonians so they don't know that the army's just marching through their territory. And then they're just like, right, off we go. We're going to march down into the middle of the forest and, and we're going to slay him. But what they don't realise is, is that the, the further and deeper they penetrate the forest of Arden, the more they become surrounded by the beastmen. And they're just kind of blinded by, uh, I suppose, Aralos' arrogance that he can just march in and do it. Yeah, and this this is like part of Aralos' character is like he's not a very wood elfy wood elf. He's he's quite brash, quite arrogant, quite self aggrandizing as well to an extent. Um, and of course, at this point, he is the chosen of Leleth, the wood elf goddess, um, and he sort of just has that "I am better than the" uh, attitude, which is very high elf like. Um, he's yeah. a very high elf like wood elf. Um, and uh, a, go- a goddess's favour does not ease his um his impetuousness. And ultimately the first time they attempt to um, go and slay Morga, they they don't succeed and they're run out of the forest and they're retreating and Neath the Prophetess is there and she's trying to like use the wood against the beastmen, close off certain areas and and kind of entangle them and trap them and not very many survive. And, you know, he basically has to go back to Ariel and, and beg to be allowed to do it again. Um, and this time he does have to change his tactics and, you know, he, next time he goes, he brings a load of way watchers with him and all the, you know, all the tracking is done properly and all the flanks are kind of checked out for, and they, they slowly encroach on their target in a much more stealthy wood elf like way before, when the battle begins, Araloth just, it starts by Araloth just loosing an arrow that just goes and like, I think it hits, I may be right, I may be wrong in saying this, I think it hits Morga or it hits a significant beast lord and then that's the signal for the for the ambushes to rise up and the beastmen don't actually know that they're there, so they turn the tables on them eventually. Yeah, um, it kills, I'm pretty sure it kills the beast lord that's sort of working under Morga. Because Morga is not a true leader. He's Morga is not a leader of Beastmen. Beastmen are just sort of gather around him. He's more of like this this godly sort of being to them. Um, that like yeah. focal point, an icon that they all sort of focus around. An eternal chaotic force that just keeps coming back and back. You know, every time he's killed, he's reborn mm-hmm. somewhere in back in the world, and um, he's known as the Corrupter because. There's like brilliant, like really like incredible imagery in the stories of the way things happen. So like if you were to, for example, like fire a cannonball at him, it, you know, his corrupting presence would turn that into like a flock of like nasty crows or something that would then fly away in another direction. Or like if you went to hit him with a sword, it would like it would turn into like a um, maybe like sort of a wet kind of like fish or something like a rotting fish or like swordfish or something instead of like maintaining its sword everything around him is just getting corrupted continuously and it takes really strong and potent magics and things to kind of to weaken him to the point where they can vanquish him which Aralot eventually does um by pouring tree sap from the oak of ages over him um and then he bursts into green flames and is gone from the world once more yeah um and what's interesting, though, as soon as he dies in this, Ariel knows instantly he's back alive. Um, mm. And she feels his death as like a cleansing of taint. And no uh, no sooner does she feel that like cleansing of the world that she, she cries because she feels it come back. 
Yeah. Um, when Araloth has finished doing that, he does have some of this tree sap left over, and on his way out, he kind of treats and heals the forest on the way back and restores it from its corruption. But because it's tree sap from the Oak of Ages, um, it doesn't only just restore it, it kind of it does it kind of um, elevates it, I suppose, and it becomes a really holy and magical place to the Britonians, and they have no idea why. <laughs> yeah, um, and of course... Rigid end times lore, there's, there's a lot around that Bretonian sort of um, thing of like why their goddess might feel like that because um, it might not be their goddess, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we won't go into that. I will not rub salt into Bretonian players' wounds. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so there's already we can see in this timeline that there's two kind of adversaries for the Wood Elves straight away and there's two uh, kind of natural allies for the Wood Elves straight away. Um, yeah. So and quite a lot going on. So already we've seen like two wars. Um, I just want to round out and just say, I guess about I think it's about six years after this happened. So we've kind of gone now. We would have kind of gone within fifty years of the timeline. So I don't want to go too much further because I don't know how much more we'll see. Um, there is a um, an event in two forty five uh, slaughter at Bleak Meadow. Yep. Um, so essentially what happens this in this season is the the beast men again but these this time the beast men who who live in the forest of athel lauren um they just grow kind of phenomenally one year they're just everywhere there's just they just spring up out of kind of every pocket every corner and they raise an absolutely gigantic army um one that the wood elves and the forest spirits really struggle to repel and the fighting goes on and on and on and it goes into the winter seasons which is when all the tree spirits um begin to hibernate and to and to sleep and to fall away um magically and the wood mm. elves actually find themselves in a situation where they're thinking we aren't going to be able to to win this one yeah um so it's like this, this massive just sort of overwhelming force of beastmen that comes out of like nowhere really for some reason they're just they're just so utterly populous in how many there are um so, where so are i've i've got here it just says um all looks hopeless a sheer amount of beastmen prevail uh, the sheer amount of beastmen prevail towards the winter months and the wood elves know the forest spirits will lie dormant and unable to aid them in battle at this time a detachment of high elves led by prince eldir come to the aid of the wood elves and together they defeat beast the beastmen led by morgak the lord of crows yeah um which is really cool and this sort of like sets up like our big high elf wood elf sort of friendship for later which definitely comes into play in other parts of the story um and in other times as well there's really cool bits in this story when the uh when the high elves come along because you've kind of got there's a lot of parallel units so you might have high elf spearmen fighting alongside eternal guard then you might have glade riders fighting against illyrian reavers but they're both kind of trying to prove that which one is better i suppose or that maybe the wood elves are trying to prove that they are actually still the equal of the high elves as they as they go into battle together um and it is you know there it's a kind of an uneasy alliance because the wood elves don't really like the fact that they've had to call for help or they or that they actually need this help and the high elves actually take very significant losses in in helping with the wood elves in this yeah so it, it's sort of twofold a bad thing for the wood elves one they they suppose i guess they see themselves as looking weak to the high elves but also the high elves just did them such a massive favor with the actual loss of lives that they now also feel compelled to do something in return mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it doesn't play well to elven sensibilities. <laughs> um, but yeah, really interesting again. So so now, you know, the Wood Elves, as I said, they are really front and centre in this. There's all different wars going on against Beastmen, against Greenskins. There's interaction with Bretonians in the Errantry Wars. There's interaction with High Elves fighting in Athol Lorien. You know, they are a major part of what is going on in the Old World at this time. I think introducing things like orcs and beastmen and wood elves and Britonia to shake up like all the thing of age of um, the empire versus chaos is, is going to be massively important for the games 
longevity and success. Um, all right. So why don't, on that kind of topic, why don't we talk about things that we would like to see or expect to see for the Wood Elf forces? What we'd like to see come back or explored or potentially something that wasn't explored previously that you'd like to see? Um, so one of the things that like changed like as the Wood Elves got more and more like and the next Nick book, they dropped a lot of characters from their early editions into the eighth edition. The eighth edition book, while it did introduce Araloth as a character, um, it did we did lose quite a lot of characters over time throughout the different books. And it's these secondary characters that are mentioned in the stories so much that I'd like mm. to see get a place. Like things like Naive the Prophetess. Um, she's such a massive part of the Wood Elves like story and lore. Like the whole season of Doom is based around her prophecy. Um, but she didn't yeah. have 8th edition rules. She didn't even have 6th edition rules. She actually only appears in the original 2nd edition book. Um, yeah, it would be amazing to see her. And I think you're right that she is a character who is front of center, front and center at this time. And she it isn't just Araloth charging off on his own against the Beastmen. You know, he, he take, she goes along. And actually, the only reason that they aren't all slaughtered the first time is, is solely down to her and her magical ability. Yeah, well, she's supposed to be second only to Ariel in the Wood Elves, which is no, no, like, you know, that's not a bad thing. You're second to someone who is literally a god. Because let's not forget, like, how powerful Ariel and Ryan are as characters. I think, yeah, and, and on that, it would be great to see those models come back. Um, I think, especially, I'd like to see ariel and i think people who play age of sigma would like to see ariel as the precursor to alario before she ascended sorry into into godhood yeah um, and I, th I always liked the idea of her with like with the great big um kind of like butterfly or moth wings um but the model itself i think never really held up it was never the most well her model is the second stuff. edition model it was it was always the second edition model she never received she's another one like she never received rules there was a downloadable page I remember when first starting. I could download her and score the Falconer for sixth mm. edition, I believe it yeah. was, and there was, an, and that's the last time we saw her. Her only actual army book print is once again in the original book. Mm. Um, Orion has so, been the only character. Orion, yeah, Orion is the only character for the Wood Elves to appear in every book. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, you know, maybe we'll see him again, but like you said, it'll be. Good. I think we'll probably see Araloth because he's so important to the timeline. Hopefully, Nath the Prophetess as well, because she is probably more important than than him. And then it would be nice to see um, Ariel, especially as we said, you know, for Sylph, current Sylvaneth players in Age of Sigma. So, other than heroes, what units would you like to see make a return? Um. So. For me, it's got to be Warhawk Riders. They are the, the big reason why I got into Wood Elves. Um, I've always liked Guahir and all that from Lord of the Rings were massive favourites of mine, the Eagles. Um, and I love the idea of like the Warhawk Riders. Oh, um, yeah. And if you, I think, especially the way that the design team is going, the, thing, the amazing things they're able to do with plastic now. If you look at a lot of the models, the like the motion that is carried in the models and the dynamism that is carried in them, I really think you're absolutely right that this lends itself to warhawk riders so well i mean i can only imagine the things they can do now like where you used to have kind of your static kind of warhawk on its just on its flying stand. Right, and it's on its t-frame yeah uh, whereas now you look at things and you look at like um the new lumineth realm lords and things like that and the motion that's carried on the on the wind in the, in the new release and you you just you just can only imagine like how incredible warhawk riders have the potential to be yeah no i look at things like the aether wings are like from stormcast and like all the posing that you've got on the aether wings different poses um or even the um what is it the soul black grave lords where they just got their release for the uh the fell bats mm, yeah yeah I'd, I'd love to see that for me um what i would really like to see is is kind of twofold uh for me it's about it's about war dancers I'd love yeah. to see them put back. And I think, I still think the, the older sculpts, the metal sculpts were really good. Um, but obviously they're out of production and we've had a shift away from metal. I don't think we'll have 
um, I don't know if we'll have resin. I kind of hope that we don't, um, in a way, um, especially not fine cast. Um, but I'd love to see them because, again, they're a really dynamic, amazing unit. And I really like their play style. They had these kind of multi different ways of playing. And the same as the Dryads used to, actually. The Dryads used to have a same similar role where they'd fight in different play styles. Um, as they played and I just really like the idea of them you know there was a rule where they were able to you could have them um, behind your lines and they jump over a unit and then start fighting and things like that and I'd and I'd like to see those kinds of rules and that kind of dynamism carried across in the in the new sculpts I'd be really excited to see that yeah Wood Elves for me they are probably the iconic look of Wood Elves um, like you think Wood Elves what answers all that unit that just pop up and you think of, I mean, they've even like started bringing some of the aesthetics into like the Kernothi models, and you've seen like Skase Wild Hunt. Mm. Like that was the thing everyone said when we saw Skase Wild Hunt. We saw the Mohawks, we saw them painted up with red hair. Everyone's just like, this is War Dancers, and I think that speaks a lot of like how fondly viewed they were and like how important they were. I just want to get more excited and more carried away about War Dancers because I'm just my mind's just going wild on them. I was just thinking how like primal they are compared to your kind of haughty high elves you know they're covered in tattoos and you know they're weaving all different kinds of like different weapons from staves to blades to daggers you know you've said they've got the red mohawks but they weren't all like a race of um uh red-headed people this you know their hair was dyed with the blood of their their prey and their foes um yeah. just like they were, they were white they were savage elves for, for like <laughs> a better term um yeah a kind of elf that doesn't that doesn't really exist in in the current age of sigma and didn't really exist i guess maybe you would say they're a bit like witch elves but i don't but but they're also, not in the they're same still way quite different yeah yeah um yeah so i'd love to see them but yeah um way watchers uh to go on to them are they're my favorite they're my favourite unit that Games Workshop have ever made, and I still have my fifth edition um, Metal Way Watchers. I've got twenty of them painted up to be Shadow Warriors in my Cities of Sigmar army um, because I just won't be without them. And I think as the game changes, I'll still try and find places for them because they're the models that I remember collecting when I was in school and the stuff that you know I loved all the idea of them setting traps that they used to be able to do and hiding in the shadows and stalking and, and jumping out and then in eighth edition they just turned them right up to like up to 11 didn't they where they could just like when they fired at something they just ignore armor because they were that good they'd find the chinks in the armor so like they'd they'd shoot someone in the in the eye slit of their visor if they were like a heavy armored knight they got the sniper rule as well on them in eighth, they were they were amazing. I remember taking out so many of my opponents. Generals turn one with way watches. <laughs> um, I used to run a unit of fifteen of them, um, max unit size in eighth, and they would just pop up out of the trees that I would put down because I had the oak of ages, the acorn of ages, um, <laughs> which is a fantastic story. Um, on an aside, that is still the greatest wood elf story ever of when a squirrel ate an acorn of ages and grew to be taller than the forest. <laughs> and it took a whole six armies of wood elves to take it down. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And maybe, so maybe they'll release a giant squirrel for, <laughs> for the old world. But, um, but yeah, Way Watchers for me, they, they are the, the most wood elf, wood elf unit. Um, they're that, that hide in the forest, perfect with a bow. Right. They do everything that's, you think when you think what they're, they're legolas taken to the nines which is mm. wood of extraordinaire yeah they're definitely um top of my list of models i'd like to see returned and i think um it's an aesthetic that i think games that is still appealing to games workshop in the design studio um when you look at uh Quilathus the exile for cursed city and how her pose is so similar to the old way watcher lord it's something that i think you know a trope that, that games workshop still want to continue yeah um what well, was funny because i think they're they've got certain units within their range that actually make them quite unique and they're not one of those armies that is very generic and i think while we are going to see the return of the old world i do think we're going to see them try to focus on the parts that make the old world different from a generic fantasy setting that maybe it sometimes fell into mm. um like and Waywatchers and Wood Elves definitely are the elves that do that. 
Yeah. Okay, Luke. So I think lastly, what I want to talk about is just, do you have any thing that is maybe a bit out there on your wish list or something that is high on your wish list that we haven't spoken about yet in terms of um, play styles or in terms of rules or in terms of models? Hmm, something out there. Um, like I've, I've talked about one of my big ones is I want to see that Horace Heresy character series. That is that is definitely mm -hmm. like something I want to see. But for me, I think rules-wise, the game needs to have learnt from what it was and the mistakes it made across multiple editions because I don't... Sixth of me is probably the best fantasy ever was. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I think 8th was probably the second best edition, and I know 8th had its problems, but it was better. 7th is that weird edition that everyone forgets about. It's that midway point between 6th and 8th that's mm. neither one nor the other, and it really lacks sort of thing. But um, I think it's important, games rule-wise, they learn from the best parts of what made 6th great was um, combat manoeuvres and all that sort of stuff. And there was not and like how particularly the units used to feel like they should on the table, like cavalry felt really strong in sixth. Mm. Eighth, on the other hand, did some good things by making units strong um, and making magic exciting. Um, <laughs> um, maybe a little bit too over the top, but it made magic exciting. And that's yeah. something good. Um, and then, you know, you've got other editions that did other things great, like um, Heroes being cool was fourth edition was Hero Hammer, if I'm correct. Yeah. Um, um, but I think all these different things we've learned of, like, the good and bad through the editions, you've got eight, eight editions to go back on, and I hope the playtesting and the thought process behind it is they look at all eight editions, what they did well, what they did wrong, mm. and learn from it. Plus look at other games that are still breaking flank, things like Kings of War, things like War of the Ring that they did is probably, to be honest, War of the Ring is still the best game that Games Workshop have ever made. Um, the rule says sublime, isn't it? Yeah. Um, stand by that. Like every War of the Ring is an amazing game. If you haven't played War of the Ring, go have a look because it is a really good solid system. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think they could learn things from like from War of the Ring. They learn things from Age of Sigma from 40k. That's the most important thing is making sure that rule set learns from why fantasy died. I think for me, um, when I was when this when the maps were revealed and you've got all the different provinces, um, what I really hoped that they would do, um, which is something that they've done a lot in Age of Sigma, and something that they did do a bit with the Wood Elves, is um, is have you know multiple play styles for your armies and multiple regions where your army can come from. You know they did do this with the Empire and they had the Heraldry book, and I would like to see Kindreds come back for the Wood Elves, so you would hmm. have. Um, uh, what do we have like glamour week which are like the kind of the magical ones and you'd have like a war dancer kindred so your army could be led by a war dancer and i'd like to yeah. see that impact the play style and the unit selection of the army um so you would have different tailored forces depending on the law and the play style that you want to follow yeah and that's that's something to look at that's something that age of sigma probably does better than any fantasy edition ever did mm -hmm. um is allow the army to play in different ways and fundament like without losing what that army is about, fundamentally change how that army plays, though. Um, uh, there's probably no better look at it than actually go check out Soul by Gravelords. Um, that book's fantastic at showing you a bunch of different ways to play. Whether or not they're competitive, that's irrelevant. But it shows you a bunch of different ways to play. Yeah, and all of the, the different models. specific heroes, like kind of like we said. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Gravelords great. is a great look at like something they can learn. Cities does it well, but Gravelords, for me, is really good at that. But yeah, that sort of thing of like learning, like making armies be able to be changed and having all that composition is just is just something that really can help make more armies more appealing to more people. Yeah, and the last thing that I would like to see, which is um, on my kind of out there wish list, but maybe it's not too far away, is I would like to see a detachment that you could bring from the Wildwoods. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, and so I guess want, I think you're like kind of like I guess the law master here, Luke. So do you want to just talk to us just briefly about what the Wild Woods is and what it looks like and the kind of heroes that that and characters that inhabit it? Yeah, so I guess let's start with how the Wild Woods came to be. Is probably like a little play. 
um, quickly. So the, effectively, there was a time and part where the tree spirit sort of grew, or particular tree spirits grew a little bit uncomfortable with having the wood elves among them. They started to see that the wood elves were becoming as much part of the forest as the tree spirits were themselves. And they didn't particularly like that Athelorum was actually accepting these wood elves now. Um, and so they tried to take it into their own hands and a particular tree lord known as Coadil um, tried to betray and stop the ritual of summoning Orion. Um, and in the end, he's not successful. Ariel beats him back um, because don't you touch my man. Um, <laughs> and she effectively imprisons him in this southern quarter of Athel Lauren um, via these giant waystones that she plants around there and entraps him and all his handmaidens into this wildwood area that thus becomes known as the wildwood and it's full of these like ev like truly evil malicious wicked tree spirits yeah um, and it's guarded the whole way around by the wildwood rangers who are all um yeah. they're all elves who have been orphaned by these malevolent tree spirits that, that grow up you know parentless um with this soul duty to to make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else yeah um and of course this is where drachi comes into the story that drachi's sort of coadil's little um envoy she sneaks mm. in she sneaks out um yeah and she, I... cause she didn't follow him but she sort of using his influence for her own gain and these are kind of also the, the precursors to the spite revenants that we, that we see. And it's just yeah. another aspect of Atholorin that was always in the law, um, but was never fully kind of fleshed out. And I think it would be interesting, you know, to see if, if they would do anything with that or just keep it in the law. And I want to see a leather bound book like they did in Horus Heresy. If, if they release it and, the, and there's leather bound tomes, Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, expensive. I've I've got the I've got the black books for Horus Heresy, and they are they are a treat. They're gold leafed edged. Mm. Um, they're, they're amazing. Yeah, it's something that would make it feel really special and quite quite precious to to collectors and people who have invested. You know, we're talking. I started this game twenty years ago, and it's it's a massive massive part of my life. You know, um, over half my life I've been playing and, and loving this game. So. Um, something like that would be would make it really special. Yeah, no, it, it's those things that are going to make this game something special. Um, that the character series um, be really cool. Well, Luke, thank you very much for coming on. It's it's always a, a pleasure to, to chat to you. Um, and thank you, you know, for your for your input and your amazing knowledge of of everything Waddell found the world that was. Been a pleasure, man. Um, love chatting about something that like i don't get to chat as much as i used to about mm. um but yeah um guys please check out luke's channel uh luke's channel cinderfall gaming <laughs> i have to say is is certainly my my absolute favorite um age of sigma channel um it's really great for people who are looking to get in into the game or have got any questions. He keeps up to date. It's always relevant content. It's always interesting content. And the community that Luke has grown on there is absolutely fantastic um, with a Discord server and live streams. And, um, you know, I don't want to embarrass him too much, but actually, you know, he's a really uh, great conscientious uh, guy who cares about the community that he's grown and, you know, nothing is too much if you ask a question he'll always get back to you um i just really recommend subscribing and above all i recommend checking out the mortal citizen podcast <laughs> because it is a podcast on Luke's channel that we both host together yeah no thank you very much i mean you can keep the praise coming i i love the ego boost um <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um thank you so much for having me on and yeah come check out mortal citizens me and dan chat all things Warhammer Age of Sigma relating to Cities of Sigma. So if you're watching something old world, it's probably going to have some models that you might have sitting in a closet corner. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also don't forget to subscribe to this channel. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so most definitely subscribe to Dan. Um, um, those first few subscribers are always the hardest to get. So definitely subscribe, support your the channels you like watching the most. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, well... Thank you very much, Luke. Um, always a pleasure to chat to you. Um, 
and take care of yourself, buddy. And thank you, everybody who watched, and I'll catch you next time. Ciao.